It seems hard today to imagine that on the first three days of July 1863, an event took place over these green farmlands of Pennsylvania, United States, that would set the course of history and have a lasting influence over all mankind for far greater significance than it would perhaps have seemed to those participants who were to survive. The battle that took place here at Gettysburg happened more by accident than planning. The Confederate Army of about 72,000 men, commanded by General Robert E. Lee, already two years into the Civil War, had invaded the northern states. At Gettysburg, the northern army, 95,000 strong, commanded by Lieutenant General George Gordon Meade, caught up with them. The battle that followed was the bloodiest of the war. The northerners finally won and Lee retreated back to Virginia, but nearly two years of this bitter war was still to run before the South surrendered. Gettysburg was where the tide turned against them. I have never seen a battlefield so well preserved and presented as this one. It is now a national military park and covers an area of some 25 square miles. To give a brief outline of the battle, we need to look at how the fighting progressed through the three days until General Pickett's final Confederate charge on the afternoon of the 3rd of July brought it to a close. To new students of the Battle of Gettysburg, it is always confusing because the South attacked the North from a northerly direction and the North defended from the South. The first contact made on the 1st of July was along McPherson's Ridge in this position here, where, infant, uh, where cavalry under Major General Buford first encountered infantry units of the Confederate Army moving towards Gettysburg in this direction down the Chambersburg Road. The town of Gettysburg is here. Dismounted, they managed to stop or check the infantry until reinforcements from General Reynolds arrived in this direction, taking up their positions along here and driving the, the southern units back along this road. However, as southern reinforcements rapidly arrived, they quickly outnumbered the northern units and started to push them back towards Gettysburg. A second southern army or a southern army unit and the general Ewell advancing from the north in this direction struck Howard here <coughs> and pushed his forces back to this position on Cemetery Hill where they ended up on the night of the 1st of July. This is where the Battle of Gettysburg began. General Buford. Facing west, Buford's cavalry manned this position and defended it against the advancing Confederate troops of Hayes coming down the Chambersburg Road. Shot fired is reputed to have been fired by the cannon furthest from me, facing towards my car. Buford's thin line of cavalry was able to hold out here for two hours until reinforcements in the form of regular troops under General Reynolds arrived to support him. The arrival of Reynolds' brigades forced the Confederates to fall back, but Reynolds was killed in the action. This ridge, known as McPherson's Ridge, immediately in front of Seminary Ridge, was defended successfully all morning by the Union troops. But by the afternoon, with reinforcements arriving from the Confederates, they were pushed back and forced to retire to Cemetery Hill behind Gettysburg. The Confederate troops 
attempting to advance up this railway cutting were very badly cut up. Richard to John Burns, who at the age of 75 came out to fight. This is the wood and the Willoughby Run, across which Major General Meredith's Iron Brigade charged driving back the Confederates on the morning of the 1st of July. However, pressure from more and more Confederate soldiers eventually pushed them back up the hill to their defensive position above. The marks the spot where they finally stood. The forest named after Major General Meredith. Stone stone infant, infantryman still guards the railway crossing in which so many Confederate soldiers died. And still goes through to Gettysburg. Everywhere. Ting. Believe it, but there goes a real enthusiast dressed in his Confederate Army uniform. And the Lutheran Seminary on Seminary Ridge. From here, a clear field of fire right across the Gettysburg and Cemetery Hill was maintained by the Confederates. Seminary Ridge became General Lee's headquarters on the 1st of July. After that, he moved into another house in Gettysburg. Stone walls seen all over Gettysburg. This one was built during the battle. Have a good day, sir. Thank you, sir. That is a man dressed in a doctor's uniform of the Confederate Army. All the guns along Seminary Ridge and everywhere else in Gettysburg are originals. Construction of this battlefield was begun in the late 1880s. Root defence lines just below the crest of Seminary Ridge. Napoleon cannon. On day two of the battle, Lee now switched his attack, which had previously been from the north, to the south-west, trying to drive in the Confederate units along this front. The final straw, as far as day two is concerned, was fought here at Little Round Top. A touch-and-go battle resulted finally in the Confederates being pushed back and consequently having to concede that day. Peach Orchard and the approaches to Little Round Top 
that the heaviest fighting on the second day, July the 2nd, took place at Gettysburg. See the casualties suffered by the Union that day were quite astronomic. 4,211 men of this one armed unit alone. The panel tells its story. And if you look at this old photograph and the building behind, we look up and see the same building still standing today. Never saw the name of a man that was worth recording. It had to be this one. If any connection he had with Australia's highest mountain, I do not know. Behind this monument is Little Round Top. The importance of Little Round Top was not realized by either Lee or Meade at the beginning of the Battle of Gettysburg. Both, however, realized that it was a key position. Whoever held it controlled the battlefield of Gettysburg. This is a view from the summit. The Devil's Den. Just make out tower from which the previous scenes which were taken. The man saved the Union cause at Gettysburg. That must rest on this man's shoulders. General Warren detected the Confederates flanking move and manned the round top only minutes ahead of the Confederates. In the Commander Joshua Chamberlain, Congressional Medal of Honor. Recipients. Having failed to break Meade's line and defenses on the second day, Lee changed his tactics on the third day and in the afternoon made a final and desperate ban uh, uh, infantry charge against Meade's uh, western flank from here. Starting off along Seminary Ridge, Pickett's brigade, reinforced by men from Pettigrew's unit, 12,500 men advanced against this position in the final and desperate charge known as Pickett's Charge today. It failed, but only just, and in doing so, it lost the battle for Lee. Of the 12,500 men that set out, more than 10,000 never returned. Dust. The flags flutter and snap. Low words of command are heard. And thus, in perfect order, this gallant array of gallant men marches in our ranks. As the men cross the Emmitsburg Road and reach the Union defenses, James Carter of the 53rd Virginia overheard General Armistead ask Color Sergeant Blackwell to plant the colors on the enemy's works. Color Sergeant Blackwell was now shot down. I seized the colors, but another of the guards, Scott, snatched them out of my hand and ran about 15 feet out in front of the brigade and waved them. He was instantly forward, severely wounded.
gambling lot is supposed to represent Union troops. Streamed back across the field, General Lee rode out through the smoke and dust to console and rally his men. Exhausted men hobbled along, anguished, crippled, some using rifles or each other as crutches. Although Lee's words gave comfort, the vivid memories of this defeat remain. J.H. Moore of the 7th Tennessee remembered, as the charging column neared the Emmitsburg Road, volley after volley of small arms aided with dreadful effect in thinning our ranks. 18th Virginia remembered, I was struck down by a fragment of shell about 100 yards from the clump of trees. Semi-conscious, my blood almost blinding me, I stumbled and fell among some rocks, severely injuring my knee. G.W. Finley of the 56th Virginia describes the scene on cemetery. Tain, some of the beautiful scenery. the field over which Pickett charged, the last final desperate effort of Lee to win the Battle of Gettysburg. They came from that position on the edge of the hills where Lee's monument stands today. The line that the survivors of the Pickett charge reached and actually crossed in General Armistead with his sword held high, his hat on his sword, was struck down and killed at the point where these people are standing watching the scroll, looking at the scroll. This attack has always been called the high water mark of the Confederacy. They never succeeded in getting this far again, although the war was still to run almost two years. This photograph is from a reenactment of Pickett's charge done every year at Gettysburg in commemoration of this great battle. This graphic painting shows General Armistead at the climax of Pickett's charge just before he was shot down. At the end of the third day, Lee decided to call the whole action off. His Confederates had suffered 28,000 casualties. The Union casualties were 23,000 men. A total of 51,000 had been lost on this battlefield.